Well, welcome. Good to have you with us. Um, this guy right here, that's Dr. Michelle Furtado. He's uh, He's been here for a whole th three years. Three years now. Wow, yeah. wow. And this person over here is trying to hide. Yeah, there's Danielle. She's here too. <laughs> she'll add to she'll add to the conversation. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. I don't know. All right. So tonight, what we're going to talk about is it's going to be a treatment planning session. But I'm glad that Michelle is here because Michelle is also going to probably throw in some perspectives on what it's like to be a young guy in an old guy's practice, or maybe an old guy in a young guy's mm -hmm. practice. I'm not sure because we're kind of reversing roles. So let me tell you a little bit about that first. Michelle started here three years ago. We three years ago next month. Yeah. Um, and um, gradually, Michelle has, um, first of all, let me beat him up for two years. And yeah, Dr. Lee Sheldon residency. Holy <laughs> mackerel. Yeah. So, um, which is the first thing. I mean, can you imagine getting out of residency? Then you become board certified. Then you work in another practice for a while. Then you come over here and I'm beating you up. I mean, I'm trying not to beat you up, but I kind of beat you up every once in a while. It's learning. Yeah. It's never, never hurts. So, yeah, Michelle had to actually watch me do surgery for three months. I don't think I would let you touch a bitch for three months. Yeah. <laughs> and then I watched him constantly for the next three or four months and then intermittently for the next year and a half. And now Michelle's pretty much on his own. And now I'm pretty, I, I, I really am occupying the, the spot of, of of director of dentistry i'm no longer doing surgery i stopped i stopped doing surgery what almost a year ago except for one patient yeah so um yeah and so we're, we'll talk about those gradual some of those experiences maybe but um the basic part of this is to get back into treatment planning mode we were doing treatment planning sessions a year ago um and did them for a while and over the past what three, four months, Danielle, we've had demand from particularly from younger periodontists right. yep. to the treatment planning webinar. And so we're going to put the treatment planning webinars back. We're going to do that uh, starting next season, which begins in July. But we thought we'd put one in today just so you can get some flavor, get an idea as to what these are like. And of course, when we did the treatment planning webinar on AAP Connect last month, I mean, the, the amount, the number of people who, who joined us was just phenomenal. So if we can do it for AP Connect, we can certainly do it for you and can make it much on a much more personal level. So with that, we're going to introduce to you um, this particular case. I'm going to shut off the webcam for now so that everybody can kind of relax and I can get close to the camera and Michelle don't, and I don't have to be on top of each other. So let's go over some of this. And we'll, we'll look at this particular case. And um, this is a case I walked in this, this week. In fact, it's the case that I wrote about on AP Connect this week. So perio versus implants, a, a topic of conversation um, that you've seen us talk about for a while. Um, so here's a patient referred by the internet. Okay, so number one, referral comes by internet. How do most of our patients come in? By internet or by the magazine? Okay, in the internet, there's a number of different ways that we market. Uh, through the internet using Google AdWords. Uh, just the past two months, we've had a postcard campaign to get people to come to our website. I'm not sure that's been very effective. Um, and, and and people come in also as a result of our, our dental implant lecture. We also have some search engine optimization. And there are certain other things that we do on the internet. And it's not just us. It's Gilead Dental Marketing helps us with that in order to be able to, to help more people come in. Ace Chat is a very, very big part of it. Ace Chat, uh, if you go to our website, drleesheldon.com, you'll see that um, people can interact with Ace Chat, and that means they can go onto a chat service, which is owned by somebody in Colorado who knows enough about our practice because she asks and we tell her that she can pretty much help us with, uh, help, help patients decide whether they want to make the next step and make that phone call. Okay, so the person made the phone call. And there was no doctor phone call for this particular person. Okay, so here's the patient data. The 77-year-old male is referred by internet and TV. And we've had, we had a TV presence years ago. Um, and we still have a TV show helping seniors. We're tied in with the seniors organization. And they run a constant TV show. They have about 100 episodes. And we're on about 12 or 13 of them. So we're also running as a public service uh, on TV. So he's been, he was an active patient in another office and, was, and 
that office, that doctor referred the patient to an oral maxillofacial surgeon for an upper hybrid. I'll go more into that a little bit later. Okay, 77 years old, you expect there'd be some health problems, and yeah, he had a heart, heart attack in 1999, had a stent placed, he's type two, type 2 diabetic, last A1C was six months ago, 6.9. Okay, he's on two medications for prostate, two medications for diabetes, two medications for blood pressure, and why this keeps on changing, I don't know, but okay. Um, and on aspirin, and he's on some supplements too, and he smokes one pack of cigarettes a day, and he said he's not gonna stop smoking cigarettes. Good for him. He's 77 years old. Okay. Let's take a look at some photos. So there he is in all his glory. Okay. So you see he has somewhat of a dentition. You'll see that he has a partial denture down there. You see this cantilevered fixed bridge, and this is going to be the area of the most interest. We want to look at tooth number 11, the cantilevered number 10. This is going to be the key element. I said that twice. I don't think I have to say it a third time. There'll be some other key elements here. You'll notice certain things that have occurred. For example, notice this here. And notice how that might be related to this here. It's going to be an important element here. There he is back in the collusion again. I think you've seen everything you need to see as far as photos go. Okay, so let's get back. Um, okay, he had root planing done in October with that general dentist. A restant was placed in October, and the restant was placed on tooth number 11. And the patient said if he can keep his teeth, he'd like to. He doesn't want to do the hybrid. And he did some research on the internet about sinus and bone loss. He was kind of uh, up on periodontal disease and how that could possibly cause a sinusitis. Uh, we did a snap, which means that we took a, took a photograph and we did our imaging. Uh, the other key element is tooth number 11 had a root canal done years ago, and he's had food caught there all the time, and now the tooth has some discomfort. He uses floss picks all the time. Okay, so number 11, number 11, number 11. So let's look at the pocket depths, and you see the pocket depths here, uh, and you'll notice here's tooth number 11, 8 millimeter pocket on the distal lingual. Seven millimeter pocket on this facial. I think there's some separation coming out of it. Okay, we're concentrating on periodontal. Let's talk about occlusion. So we check occlusion with shim stock. That means we have the patient closed down on a piece of shim stock on each of the individual contacts. So it'd be tooth number two with 31, number three with 30, number four with 29, uh, et cetera. And we measured the occlusion here. Okay, so we had positive occlusion on number seven, eight, nine, 11, and 13. He had no occlusion on numbers 4, 5, and 12. Isn't that interesting? And good old tooth number 11, the one with the periodontal disease, which you're about to see. That's the one he had fremitus on. Okay? If anybody believes in secondary trauma from occlusion, I'm about to show it to you. So let's, uh, let's first of all say where we are. Okay, so I do the exam. Um, and that I, these, are, these are Laura's notes. She says, I'm going to save what we can. Um, I've already measured the clues. We talked about that. Um, and let me go to the radiographs for a second. This is a little bit premature. Let me go to the radiographs. So let's look at the FMX. There you go. So we'll key in on number 11, but don't forget... The patient had periodontal therapy done in the general dentist's office. And the general dentist said, I give up. I'm referring you to the oral maxillofacial surgeon for extraction of all of your upper teeth. He looks on the internet and says, sees, oh, we do hybrids, but we're also periodontists and we save teeth as well. So he decides to make the appointment with us because we do both. Remember, we've talked about how important it is that we be able to do both, that we can extract teeth and that we can replace teeth with dental implants. And that's why he never saw the oral maxillofacial surgeon. And that's why he saw me as soon as, or that was the appointment he made, was making an appointment with us. So let's take a look at this, four and five. He's 77 years old. Can you save numbers four and five? How about six, seven, and eight? Can you save six, seven, and eight? These teeth had no mobility at all. 
Okay, there's seven and eight. There's eight and nine. And here's good old tooth number 11, which is in what? It's in Fremitus. He's hitting that tooth prematurely. That tooth, which has a cantilever, which has a root canal, and number 12 is not in contact with anything. It would have been in contact with a partial denture because there was nothing else to oppose it. And there's 12. And notice, here's the shadow coming from the distal of 11. But take a look. On the meso of number 12, there's bone there. That tooth doesn't move. 13, okay, you could make some arguments, but there's still bone there. Here's 14 or 15, whatever you want to call it. There's still bone there. Okay. On the lower, he's got a partial denture. He has teeth. He has some bone support. You might argue that he would have more of a need for a hybrid on the lower than he does on the upper, except for tooth number 11. Okay. So now what would you do? What would you do? Think about what you would do here. And let's go into what we would do. Shelly, you have any comments so far? Um, yeah, I think something. We, we talked about the fact that I've been here for three years and, and I've uh, watched you do surgeries. But, you know, when I, when I say Dr. Lee Sheldon <laughs> residency, I mean more than that. I mean, we um, there are parts of, of the practice that we don't learn in any school. And there are systems in place in some offices that make the office work. And that's basically what the residency for me was here, not only on the, the treatment of patients, but also in, in the fact that you have to have a presence in the community. And Dr. Sheldon said that really um, nicely, that you, you can't emphasize that enough, that you have to make yourself known as someone who can diagnose and, and do all aspects of dentistry. Um, so that's my point so far, and I think um, for, for the case uh, itself, we spend hours and hours and hours as residents doing seminars for patients like this. And, and you know, we have all the literature under our arms and, and we have discussions of, you know, five hours seminars, discussions of how to do this. But um, the, the focus here is first what the patient wants and, and, and needs. And there, there's what always comes to my mind are the four things that Dr. Shelton uh, always says that the patients look for dentists, why they look for dentists. And, and, you know, that's why it's so important that we start with the pictures. You know, they want to smile. They want to chew. They don't want to lose. The, they don't want to smell. Um, so the, that, it's so important that we um, focus first. We'll look at what the patients want and, um, and they want to smile. And this, in this case, if we just um, had a presence as periodontist who saves teeth, he would never come to us. Or if we just had uh, a presence of periodontist who extract teeth and place implants, he would never come to us. So those are things that you don't learn in, in school. And I, you know, again, we can't emphasize enough how important that is. So uh, I think for now, uh, those are the most, to me, those are the most important messages. Uh, we can go over the Maguire prognosis of tooth by tooth in this case. And, and uh, in my opinion, I think we can save most of them. The only tooth that we would call poor or, or hopeless there, according to the Maguire uh, classification, would be number 11. The rest would be, you know, in the worst case, poor. Uh, I think all of them were fair. And we know from that same paper that the long-term stability of teeth that are treated that are considered fair is is there so we can we can save the teeth we can we can we can treat the teeth and keep this patient happy with what he wants okay so let's look at this thank you michelle so we, we we look at this and the patient wants to save teeth first of all i've got to tell you that um what you're seeing here are the notes the laura made it's so important that as i'm speaking that you, if, and I know there's some assistance on tonight, that you make notes of everything that the doctor says in the operatory. This is your medical legal document. This essentially um, shows that there has been an independent person making notes on exactly what's been said. And I can't tell you how important it is, rather than sitting there to actually type, keep on typing 
everything is said, just keep on typing. Just put it in there to make sure that there's good documentation of what's occurred. And so what I did say was this. Number 11 is in front of it. I didn't say that. I said that to her. It's in front of us. But, and there was a little bit of, of separation when probing. And then I tell him, I think, and I don't know why this keeps on going forward, but whatever the reason, um, we can do a do an oral DNA test. I rely on the oral DNA test for diagnosis of periodontal disease at least 50% of the time, maybe more than that. Uh, the oral DNA test is an accurate test. No, it's not a culture and sensitivity. It isn't. But if you culture a patient, you have a, uh, you take a sample with a swab or a paper point or whatever you use, and you put it in transport media and you fly it to another part of the country, those bugs die. And there may be better transport media now than when I was doing cultures and sensitivities before, um, but the accuracy of the oral DNA is uncanny. In other words, they'll identify the bacteria and they'll give you a, suggest, a suggested diagnostic di di um, a treatment regimen with antibiotics, if in fact you choose to, based on the 11 different primary periodontal pathogens. We're talking about primary periodontal pathogens. I know there's hundreds of bugs in the mouth. We're talking about the bugs that have been identified as being associated with periodontal disease. They'll give you an appropriate antibiotic, and, and the antibiotics they give you and they recommend have worked nearly every single time. Understanding, we understand that we all know that there can be a viral component to periodontitis as well. And of course, that would need to be treated differently. We're just covering the bacterial component, which I think is the majority of the of the, uh, of the types of patients we see. So I tell the patient we can do an occlusal adjustment. In other words, take that tooth out of occlusion. Tooth, take tooth number 11 out of occlusion and make sure the tooth number 13 is touching an opposing member and make sure that we have the occlusal load off of the tooth and then go down with a periscope, put a camera into that pocket and see if we can identify calculus. Maybe we'll identify a crack and we'll find out we can't save that tooth. And we advise the patient, I'm not sure whether we can save that tooth or not, but we're going to try if you choose to. And if we can save tooth number 11, we'll grow some bone back. And if we can't save tooth number 11, then we can always extract number 11 and replace it with a fixed bridge number 8, 9 through 12 and 13. It's up to him as to whether he wants to spend the money with us on the occlusal adjustment on tooth number 11, the oral DNA test, which costs uh, about uh, $99 or $150, something like that, and the perioscopy. So it's not, it, we, we added up it's going to be about $1,500 for him to try to save that tooth, and he can choose for us to try to save that tooth or to extract or, or, or to extract tooth number 11 and make the fixed bridge number 8, 9 through 12, 13 now. So he has that option. Do you want to spend the extra $1,500 on the chance that it may be saved and you may throw that money away? Or would you like to just invest the bridge? And that way it becomes the patient's uh, risk and the patient has a full understanding of the financial risk if, in fact, the tooth can't be saved. Okay? So those are the options. Save the tooth with an oral DNA test, occlusal adjustment, antibiotics, and 1IP, which means initial, it's, it's an old, it's an old uh, uh, notation, initial preparation. We don't find that periodontal disease treated with perioscopy is initial preparation. It's, it's periodontal treatment. That's, that's what we do. Periodontal surgery for this kind of disease is not something we do. It's not something I've done for years. Occasionally, we do a bone graft to regenerate bone, but the perioscopy with talent hygienist works beautifully and pockets close up. I told the patient to stay on aspirin. If he decides not to save the tooth, then take impressions for a tooth color S6 appliance to replace number 11. It's actually to replace the Pontic number 10 and number 11. We'll place PRF at the time of the extraction of number 11. We'll adjust the S6 appliance, and then we'll do buildups of numbers 8, 9, 12, and 13. So notice I'm telling the restorative dentist what needs to be done. I am the director of dentistry. I'm the diagnostician, and I'm also telling the, telling the restorative dentist exactly what needs to be done. The restorative dentist has the option of changing what I've said, but we're, we're giving the entire treatment plan. We'll put in a temporary fixed bridge, and that's a long-term temporary fixed bridge, number 8, 9, uh, through 10, 11 Pontix and abutments 12 and 13, let the socket heal and then put in the fixed bridge if in fact he either chooses to extract number 11 or if the treatment that we do on number 11 fails. Okay, let's go over some other radiographs so you can see the whole thing. 
CT scan is important to me. It's important to me for a lot of reasons. Um, there's a lot that we can see on a CT scan. And so we're now going across the CT scan. You'll notice the bone support. There's good bone width here. If implants were ever to have been chosen, if he chose to have a hybrid done, which I think is silly, um, but if a hybrid were done, it would have been done just fine. Assuming they might stop smoking for a little while, which he said he wouldn't. By the way, do you, he also asked me, can we take this tooth out and do a bone graft at number 11 and put an implant? The answer is no. We have to build that bone and you're a smoker. And you've got an A1C of 6.9. I don't know if it's going to go up or down. Um, no. Um, besides that, even if we could, it would take us a year and a half to grow the bone and put an implant in. Why do you want to do that at the age of 77? Do the fixed bridge. So now you get 12 and 13. And the one tooth that's in contact is tooth number 15 with 18 on the left side. Other than it's either 15 and 18, or it's tooth number 11 with tooth number 20, what, tooth number 21. Mm -hmm. That's all that's in contact in, that, in the mouth. So we're going to take this out of occlusion. This is all that's going to be in contact on the side until we get over to a couple of teeth over here. And by the way, 28 and 29 are not in contact with numbers 4 and 5. How important is occlusion in this case? We're about to find out. Now, we haven't treated him yet. He has decided, however, that he wants us to treat it. He wants us to try to save number 11. Let's look at um, <clears throat> the anatomy software. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Not, to be, not a, a lot to be shown here. But if you want to see what an implant would be like, I can show you that. <clears throat> we use this all the time to show the patient how an implant could be placed. Look at how easily the implant fits in within the jawbone here. <clears throat> yeah, I can show number 11 if you'd like. I see. Okay. I was just showing. Okay. See, he doesn't hesitate to correct me. <laughs> Not that kind of relation. <laughs> I just thought you. <coughs> you thought I couldn't count. Is that what you said? How, how would eleven be? <laughs> yeah, okay, take a look at this in, in in the space right here. So yeah, there'd be no opportunity for an implant unless we regrow all the bone. And who wants to grow, regrow all that bone? We don't have to. Um, the fixed bridge would be just fine here. So that is the picture of this case. Um, we've decided, um, therefore, to go ahead and treat, as I've said. And if you have any questions, um, you can type the questions in the chat line. That's pretty much it as far as the treatment plan presentation, except we've noted the following. Yes, we're going to closely adjust this. Yes, we're going to treat this tooth. Yes, we hope bone is going to go back, and we don't have to extract this cantilever fixed bridge. But what are we doing later on? We're restoring the occlusion. Okay? Do I want to put an implant down here? You're darn right I do. I want an implant here. I don't want a partial denture here. And, and we can now talk the case and make sense when he knows what teeth are touching and what aren't. And so if we put an implant in number 20 site and get tooth number 13 working again, isn't that the advantage of tooth number 11? Will that make sense to the patient? Of course he will. And if he was willing to spend the money in a hybrid, which he was, He's certainly going to be willing to spend money on this, but we want to solve this problem first and see if we can get this problem solved. And then the next step, he already knows the occlusion's off. He already knows the teeth aren't meeting. He was biting down as we were tearing, as we were pulling that shim stock between the teeth. He saw that the teeth weren't meeting. So he's an educated patient. And therefore, once we get this area healed, it opens the door to saying, all right, listen, we got this area good. Or maybe we didn't do okay. Wouldn't it make more sense for us to get all of the teeth in contact? So now four and five are in contact with numbers 12 and 13. He was talking to me about chewing efficiency. I said, you know, you'll gain your chewing efficiency by making sure that your crown's contact. You, he asked me, can I put another tooth in the molar area? You may not need it. Let's get 12 and let's get four and five in contact with number 29, 28 and 29 first, and then see if you even need that. That registers. That makes sense. We do more dental implants than anybody in Brevard County, Florida. 
And the reason we do more implants than anybody in Brevard County, Florida, is because of our refusal to do implants where they're not indicated. That is the difference. Yeah, you know, the marketing can only go so far. It's what happens when the patient walks into the office after the marketing is done. Are we like the people who advertise on TV talking about the one uh, the one type of solution, dental implants, or are we offering the patient a real choice? Yeah, that's that's uh, really, really important. I think um, one thing, just going back, just so that I don't lose this, I, what I thought from my perspective, from a young periodontist, which is coming, but I've well, just been been graduated for less than 10 years uh, um, there's a lot of questioning about well you're going to do oral dna or you're going to do uh, culturing and 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 lee has covered that really well i think the oral dna is a pcr evaluation which means you're getting the the genetic code of the bacteria dead or alive um, then uh, what the company does is that they look at the complexes from the the classic paper from sopransky that divides into the uh, yellow, uh, orange, and, 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 and red complexes. And then based on that, there's a suggestion of, of therapy in antibiotics. And by the way, we only follow that if we think is appropriate. We just don't blindly follow all that they recommend. So there's, there's also a, a questioning from our experience uh, of when, the, when the results from the oral DNA analysis come. So that, that aside, as a young periodontist, I will ask, well, why are we, why are we, why do we want to know what kind of bacteria is there? We know it's periodontal disease. We know that we know that the, 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 the bacteria that cause periodontal disease. So what do I want to know? I just give the classic, you know, Korean, Korean paper that does amoxicillin and metronidazole and that's it. I'm covered. Well, basically, uh, okay, you can do that too. But if we're targeted to the exact bacteria that are in the mouth, um, even before we do any therapy there, um, and, and this is this is based on, on my master thesis in, in, in Connecticut when I did my residency was in microbiology. So I'm, I'm speaking from experience. We have uh, three papers publishing in that area. Is that the more we look at this at the bacterial profiles at the microbiome of patients, we notice that the total load of bacteria is as important, if not more important than knowing the specific bacteria. So if you're doing some type of antimicrobial therapy systemically, uh, you're decreasing the total load. Do you think the patient would respond better to therapy or not? And with all that, we know that P. G, P, uh, uh, P. ginger valley, valleys invades the soft tissue uh, and AA invades the soft tissue. Um, we will get that copper and the ability for the patient to respond to this is is much better and you know for me to get to this thinking after residency it took some um, some having an open mind to to accepting this because in residency we would never give antibiotics without treating we actually we would probably do antibiotics and treat at the same time but not without uh, not before treating uh, and, and to me, it makes sense. And, and the amount of patients that I see here that don't have to go to, to periodontal surgery because of this, because we do perioscopy um, after or in conjunction with antibiotics is, is amazing. I've seen 10 millimeter pockets, 11 millimeter pockets go to five and four that are maintainable uh, uh, teeth uh, that I wouldn't, I wouldn't imagine that in, 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 in residency. So that's the, the, the oral DNA covered. Now, if you're looking as a youngster, you're looking at number 11 and you say, I can't say that, uh, there's too much bone loss, the, the, it's in framenos, and I'm, it's, why try to save it? Just look at the Cordellini papers. Cordellini, what he would do here, he would do a flap and he would s scale and, and, and clean that tooth like it's the last thing he's doing is his life and he's, he was going to split that tooth. And you, what you see, you know, three months, two, three months later is that there's bone fill. And the tooth is saved. We're kind of doing the same thing. We're just using a microscope that really traces down the root every millimeter. And you know, we could even argue that okay, if they if the end result is a is a is a fixed bridge there from eight to thirteen, 
you could provisionalize the tooth as a splint and then do the IP with uh, with the antibiotics there. Do the, the perioscope with the antibiotics. You're, you're splinting the tooth. So there's nothing here that's unfounded that we're just inventing. I mean, the, 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 the science is there. It's just you know how many of our how many of the dentists who haven't gone through residency would know this and would you know be able to talk to you in, at this level. Um, now that doesn't mean that you shouldn't talk to them intelligently um, about restorative treatment, and that's what we do. And it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that they have to really do exactly what we say, but at least you're supposed to know what you want to do restoratively and you can go back and forth and maybe they have better ideas but at least that communication should be open um, so i think that's what separates what we do and what we think the periodontist should do um, as as a healthcare provider notice that this patient was never referred to a periodontist and the patient had advanced periodontitis the general dentist said oh I can do the same thing that a periodontist does. Oh, well, it failed. Therefore, I'm going to refer to the oral surgeon. If that were an exception to the rule, there'd be no reason for the IDS. That is the rule. And you know it's the rule. And it's the rule among younger dentists who say, well, I can do everything because they're taught that they can do everything. And the fact that periodontists can provide options but the only way the periodontist is going to be able to provide the option is to let the public know that the periodontist can provide options. And I hope this is a case that shows you that, in fact, you know, we were able to provide options. And I hope to be able to show you a lot of bone growing around tooth number 11. I think that would be a fitting conclusion. And hopefully uh, six or eight months from now, I'll be able to show you that. So uh, anyway, you okay? Yep. Everything all right? Yep. You want to say anything? Uh, well, so far, everything that you're talking about, you guys do. You guys do all the, well, except for the gathering of the data, which is what the assistants do. But one of the biggest things that we do prior to you guys getting in is just to be sure that we are finding out really what the patient wants, because we all know that sometimes you can go in there and tell them all day long what they need, but we really need to find out what they want so that you can either inform them of why they can't have it or make it part of the plan. So um, if you have a patient that comes in with a particular want in their head and they leave and don't have a solution or, or a plan for that want, that sometimes can be part of the, the, the non-acceptance because they're not getting that. They don't understand that. So when Dr. Shellen was saying before, the educated patient, you have to be sure that you educate the why they can't do things, why things won't last, why we can't do things, and also what they can have done so they understand wh what's going on. Um, when you don't do that, you have the patient that ends up complaining later or doing a review later um, that you gave them a plan that um, wasn't real or, or that they didn't like or that they didn't understand. Um, so it's just educating your patient on that. So when we do things like this, the full series of x-ray, the CAT scan, the pictures, um, we are doing that in order to provide the data to the doctors to explain back to the patient. And we have these up on a big screen. How big is our TV? Uh, 34 inches of room and room on 37 inches every place. Else. And that's right in front of their chair so they can really understand the whys. They're blowing up the pictures. They're pointing to the reasons. They're showing the bone. They're showing the pockets. Um, they're showing the lineup on the pictures for the patients to say, I don't grind my teeth or that's not happening. So we show them it, it's there. This is what's happening. Um, and we also do things like the snap smile that you heard him talking about so we can give them a, a, a vision of what a, an after picture could look like so they can see that smile that they've been thinking about. Uh, they can have the, that, that hope and, and the, that um, we can actually do what it is that they're thinking about that maybe they thought would never exist before. Um, and then we're also talking with them. What, what is it that you want to have? Um, what is your budget to to spend on your mouth? And we're getting all this out so that we can prepare them for what the doctor is going to be presenting because we we know the cost. We we also know what they're going to, um, the options that they're going to present to the patient. We've been doing this with them for a long time and we know that 
um, implants may be an option, bridges may be an option, periodontal treatment may be an option. Um, so we're going over all this with them with models they can hold, hold in their hand um, and uh, anything that we can to educate them so they understand fully what a partial denture is, what a bridge is, what an implant is. Um, that way when the doctors come in, they present it, um, it's, it makes more sense to them. They're, they understand what's happening, what's going on. Um, so that's what we do for you guys. And after you show them all the software and, they, and you show them everything together, I feel like that's where our acceptance comes in because they really understand and they felt like that we took the time to really explain it. Because I can't tell you how many times patients say, no one's ever explained it like that before. No one's ever spent time with me like this before and, and made sure I understand it. So it's, it's huge for your patients to do that. And because of that, I can be in and out of the operatory. Michelle can be in and out yes. of the operatory in less than a half an hour because I essentially give an overview. Then I say, do this, do this, do this, oral DNA, occlusal adjustment, uh, perioscopy, we'll reevaluate. We may be able to save him, we may not. If he decides to do it, that's fine. If he decides not to do it, extract it number 11, make a fi do buildups and do a fixed bridge, 8 and 9 through 12 and 13, be done with it. It's really up to him as to whether he wants to take, um, uh, if he wants to take that risk or not. I'm saying it that fast, and then it goes to Danielle, it goes to Laura, it goes to Joy, it goes to Tasha, and they're spending another hour explaining in English what I just said in shorthand. That's how we can see 100 new patients a month. And that's how we can get the acceptance rate that we have. I insist that the, that the assistants, and some of you have heard me say this for a while, I, you know, the question is, can an assistant diagnose and treatment plan? And the answer is, she better be able to diagnose and treatment plan. She doesn't have to necessarily diagnose and treatment plan in front of the patient. That's not what we need. But she should be thinking through the case so she can explain the case that well. And you can do that with some good training. Some good training with your assistants, spending time to let them have a full understanding and give them full reign of the operatory. And when you do that, it allows you to spend less time in the operatory and allows the patient to have a full explanation of what's going on, which the assistant has time to do. And frankly, I don't. Any comments from anybody else? I think we could. All right, good. Well, we appreciate you joining us for this treatment planning webinar, and we will be doing more of these. Um, and we'll even put an implant in a case here and there. We'll actually show you that we can do that. Um, we have a uh, prospective members webinar coming up at 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. That's 23 minutes from now. Uh, you've already received the notification for it. In case you uh, want to go uh, go on that uh, go on that webinar, we'd love to have you there. There was just a notification that went out at 8 p.m. Eastern. So check your email in case you don't have the link. We'd love love to have you there. Thanks for joining us for this um, IDS webinar, and we'll talk to you again next month. Good night. Good night. Good night.